morning, Terra family. It's either because of the heat or quiet or just because you're ready to start. And um, I'll take either of that. Uh, my name is Rob Kippertis. I am uh, one of the pastors here in Troy. Welcome to our time gathered in corporate worship as we lift high the name of Jesus. Um, and church is family, right? We, we, would, cons- we would consider ourselves family we, where we gather um, as a body, we spend time together. We go through good, we go through bad times together. We get frustrated with each, with each, with each other at times. We love each other because we are united in Christ. That is what binds us together. That is the thing that we have in common. It holds us together. Jesus is the center of it all. Without him, we wouldn't even be here. And so this morning, we're digging into a passage in Philippians 4. And it speaks about not being anxious about anything. And I'm sure what we're about to do next makes some of you anxious. But, but we're here to, to embrace what God has called us to do. Um, so we, we don't do this often, but this morning I'd like you to stand. Um, and let's just greet each other in, 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 in the Lord. Um, whether a high five, maybe a handshake. And if so, bold and brave, hug one another. Because that's what we do. We love one another. ready. All right, let's lift high the name of Jesus. Let's sing to him this morning. In tenderness he sought me.
wasn't hot enough here. I figured out how to make it hotter. Is this working all right? It might be just so hot at the mic. The torrent of destruction.
gracious Father, we are people who often run towards sin instead of running away from it. We fix our eyes on our own desires and pursue them recklessly with no thought of danger to our souls. We know that we are free from the bondage of sin, yet we choose to live as slaves to sin. Father, forgive us. Jesus, our sinful souls are counted free because of our righteous, your righteous life and ransoming death. And now we are truly free to approach you with joy and confidence. Thank you for your amazing grace that draws us irresistibly before your throne to worship you, not as slaves, but as children of the Most High God. Holy Spirit, cause us to rest in the perfect goodness of Jesus Christ as our only hope and grant us growing obedience that springs from deep gratitude for all you have done for us. May we hear the words, no condemnation, and know in our hearts that we have been freed from the bondage of sin, that our chains are gone, and that our hearts are free to worship you forever. It is in Christ's name that we ask these things. Stands firm through all my life. In my searching.
not a God that is off in the distance that does not care about his people but that you know us intimately and that you never leave us to ourselves so Father in the moments where we think that we are all alone and we think that you are nowhere near us Father would you allow your spirit to remind us of how time and time again that that is not true that you know us that you love us that you forgive us you care for us, even in our darkest moments and our darkest places. Father, allow your servant to bring your word for your people this morning that we might be changed, be more like Jesus. We pray all this in Christ's precious and holy and powerful name. Amen. Amen. Would you have a seat? Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from Philippians 4, 1 to 9. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, to help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Lauren. <clears throat> Has anyone here ever worried about their life? Has anyone here, when you think about the future, you get some anxiousness about thinking about the future? Yeah. All right. So this message is for you. It's for all of us. And I, every now and, every now and then, probably not often enough, but every now and then, I feel woefully inadequate to come up here and to share with you God's word and to think that that anything will change, that I can make any difference at all. And maybe a lot of us feel that way just in the Christian life in general. And what that does usually is lead me to pray. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Let me pray. Father, only you can change a heart. Only you can make us more like Jesus. Only you can give us true and lasting peace, Lord. 
And God, I pray that you do your work this morning, that you have something stick out for each one of us that we hear in your word today. And maybe it's not in the message, maybe it's in a song, maybe it's in a conversation before or after or in a prayer or during communion or giving, whatever it is, Lord, meet us where we are. And God, I pray for many of us who likely feel as I do that we're inadequate, unable to help others see you or know you, to do this thing called being a Christian. And Lord, it's true, we can't. We can't do it in ourselves. But we're not alone. You are here, you are with us, you are in us. Thank you for that, Lord. Thank you that we are in Christ. And it's in his name I pray. Amen. Philippians 4, 1 through 9. Believe it or not, we have one more message in Philippians after today. Next week, we'll finish off chapter 4, and that's the rest of the book. And hopefully you've enjoyed it uh, as much as I have. But the main idea for this passage today, in Philippians 4, 1 through 9, is we can have peace in the midst of trouble. There was some trouble happening at the time in Philippi. It calls out the two people that were causing the trouble. We'll talk about that. But I'm going to make it a little bit more general than that as well for us. We can have peace in the midst of trouble. That's any trouble. Now and when we think about the future. So for the roadmap, I see in verse 1, Paul expresses again his heart for this church, the Philippian church. So heart for the church. Uh, secondly, a hard word for a few in the church. And that's in verses 2 to 3. And then for the rest of verses 4 to 9, I think that's about handling anxiety, which can often come from dealing with issues and relationships that we see uh, in this passage today. So that's, that's where we're going today. First, the heart for the church. Paul says, therefore, my brothers, he's talking to the church, my brothers and sisters, the church in Philippi, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. You see the language here? He's just pouring out his heart again for the church. He's saying, hey, family, I love you. I long to see you. You bring such a joy to my life. And starting the church there in Philippi, for Paul, it was one of the greatest crowning achievements in his life. He loved them, and he was not afraid to express that love for the church. He does it over and over again in this book. And we see it even in other places. In Corinthians, he brags about the Philippians as well. And so I'm not sure, as a parent, if you're supposed to have a favorite child. I'm not sure, as a church planter, if you're supposed to have a favorite church. And I'm not positive that Paul's favorite church was Philippi, but if he asked me who do you think his favorite church was, if he had one, I would say it would be the Philippian church. He expresses his, just his affection for them over and over again. And that reminded me of God's heart for his church, for every person in his church, for you. He has given us his word. He has given us his spirit. He has given us his church, one another, to help each other, to guide each other in this crazy chaotic, anxiety-ridden world that we're in. Oh, how he loves his church. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Stand firm in light of all that he said so far in Philippians chapter 1 through 4, in light of the gospel, in light of the fact that Jesus has gotten a hold of our lives, in light of the fact that we are heavenly citizens of the kingdom of God, that Jesus will return soon. Hold fast until the end. Hold fast in every part of your life. Hold fast. Stand firm. How do we stand firm? I want you to notice now in verse 1, this phrase, in the Lord. He says, stand firm in the Lord. Notice how many times that phrase in the Lord happens throughout this passage. I'll talk about that a little later. But what I'm trying to convey to you now is he's not saying stand firm because you know all this Bible knowledge. He's not saying stand firm because of all the experiences you've had. He's not saying stand firm because you can do this on your own. Stand firm in the Lord. Paul expresses his love for the church, his desire for them to stand firm. Now he's going to give some specific counsel. He needs to address 
an issue. Before he addresses the issue, he expresses his love for the church. And I think here's a little wise counsel, perhaps. Before you try to give someone advice and counsel them, often they want to know first, do you care about them? Often they want to know first, do you value them? Do you love them? Because often we're not going to listen if we don't think the person cares. Paul did care, and he's about to counsel them here. And that's in verses 2 to 3, a hard word for a few in the church. I entreat Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So here's the first time in the book where he's putting all these calls to unity and humility and joy into specific action. There were two women who were quarreling, actively arguing, fighting against one another, not with unity in the Lord. This was the issue. The whole church knew about it. Do we know what the issue was? No. But what we do know is that these two women, as Paul says, had labored in the gospel and that their names were in the book of life. Now, let me give you a real quick summary of what that means. For your name to be in the book of life means you are a real Christian. You're not losing your salvation. You're his, period. These were two genuine believers. Paul had confidence that was the case. He saw, back in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you, he will complete it in the day of Jesus Christ. He saw the good work that started in these two women. They had labored in the gospel. They are Jesus's. They're his. They're his. They're saved, sisters, and yet they're having this fight that's affecting the whole church. If any of us think we're immune to causing division and creating problem for the church, no matter how long we've been following after Christ or how much we've labored in the gospel, think again. We can. It can indeed happen. Side note, this phrase, book of life, I just wanted to throw this out there. Um, so partially maybe that all the work I did in grad school might not be wasted. Part of my thesis was on the book of life. So if you'd like more information about it and not just one sentence that I'm giving you right now, I can give you a lot more pages if you'd like to read and go into more detail. Just email me at tori at tori at terrynovachurch.org and you will get a, a mouthful of book of life. Their names are in the book of life. Believers, but they're, they're arguing. And it needs to be, it needed to be dealt with. And so what does Paul do? He calls them out by name in this letter. Could you imagine for a second on a Sunday morning, someone's up here talking like we usually do, you know, about, about the word of God. And then I say, and by the way, so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, pointing at random people, okay, we need to deal with an issue that you're causing in the church. I wonder how many few, fewer people would show up on a Sunday if you thought that would happen. Now, a little side note here. I don't know how big the Philippian church was, but they met in a home. My guess would be like 30 people. I don't know for sure. It wasn't 200. Do we deal when, when there are issues happening in the church and there's fighting and argue, like something like this happens, has happened, we will continue to deal? Yes, but we're not going to do it in front of everybody. We'll do it in more private settings and tribe and things like that. He calls them out by name. He needed to deal with the problem that was going on. And so... A thought for us here is to not be a church that just talks the talk, where we say, yeah, God is forgiving, and God is loving, and God doesn't hold grudges, and we know all this, and we say all this, and then someone else mentions some name of a person, and you're like, oh, that person's terrible, though. That person's awful. No, I'm not going to work to try to, you know, unite or solve an issue that I'm having with this person, because they're beyond help or whatever. No. We want to be people that live out the gospel, to agree in the Lord. We might not find any practical reason to want to unite with a person that we're having a disagreement with, an argument with, that we hold bitterness and resentment towards. There may be no obvious reason to say, I want to help resolve this. But he calls us to agree in the Lord. And so here's a practical potential application for you. If you are holding bitterness, resentment, a grudge against someone, 
here's my advice, just sweeping advice. Read Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, about the humility of God, and read it every day until God starts working in your heart and humbles you to the point where you're like, okay, I will, I will work through this. This does matter to the heart of God. And if Jesus, the Son of God, can humble himself and do what he did, okay, maybe I can humble myself. God can work through me to bring unity here, to not hold on to this grudge and, and, and fight that way. Now, some of us immediately think of Romans 12. It says, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And that's true. There might be someone you're having a fight with, and you've truly done all that you can. You don't hold a grudge against them, and you've forgiven them, and you've taken steps to try to address it. Maybe you've even tried to get someone else involved, and they don't want any part of it. They don't want to do Then you can only live at peace as much as possible. You can't force anyone to do anything or to see you a certain way, or to understand your, your, why you're upset, or all those things. But I think often we make it an excuse and we say, well, I've done my part, when really there's more we could do. We see unity, humility, peace in action as he calls out these women and calls for reconciliation. Now, I have another, I have a lot of side notes today. Here's another one. Am I saying that there should never be disagreements arguments in the church body no <laughs> show me one family pastor rob just said the church is a family of believers show me one family that doesn't have arguments show me one family that doesn't have the you know the the, the occasional fight disagreement working through things i'll say that's not a real family they're not that close they don't actually really talk and express and share their lives with each other I think I would be so strong as to say I think there should be disagreements that happen in church within the body because that means we're being real. But we want to work to agree in the Lord and, and ideally that means the people that are involved working through it themselves but as we see here in verse 3 Paul knew that someone else, his true companion which might have been his name or just someone who the church knew he was talking about in verse 3, true companion, help these women. Sometimes it takes someone else to come in, to mediate, and to help bring unity. I'm not saying we should never have disagreements. <laughs> Relationships, along with other aspects of life, can be messy, can be stressful, can be anxiety-producing. So let's get to the part that I think a lot of you want to talk about the most, which is handling anxiety. That's verses 4 to 9. In verses 4 to 9, I see choosing joy. I see receiving peace. I see what to think, how to think, sorry, and what to practice. Here's what we see in verses 4 to 9 of handling anxiety. So, choosing joy, verses 4 to 5. Rejoice in the Lord, there it is again, always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. He's saying, rejoice. Was the problem fixed yet? Nope. Rejoice. Was it just advice? No, it's a command. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Celebrate God. We celebrate so many things in life that are so much inferior to God. We always have a reason to rejoice and to celebrate because God is always God. Amen? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> always a reason to rejoice and celebrate because God is always God. How often should we do that? It says here, always. Always. Always a reason to celebrate. What about when something really, really hard just happened? Are you telling me I'm supposed to celebrate now? Even in sorrow, there is rejoicing. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 6.10, look, I know this is so much easier to say, right? I know what I'm saying. I'm not <laughs> saying this lightly. Grieving yet always rejoicing. You don't have to fake it. You don't have to skip around pretending like life is great when it doesn't feel great at all. But there is a joy 
There is a well of salvation that we can drink deeply of all the time. When we have J-O-Y, Jesus first, others, you. There is a well of salvation we can drink deeply of, even in the midst of pain and struggle. It's what the artwork on the next slide reminds us of, of this chrysanthemum flower surrounded by darkness and thorns, but right in the center of it all, when we are in the Lord, there is joy to be had. Choose joy. And I think what he gets at next is talking about how that joy is a witness to a watching world when he says, rejoice in the Lord always, again I will say rejoice, and then verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Your reasonableness. So our joy, and this word reasonableness, means patient gentleness. The kinds of people that aren't trying to pick fights with one another, that aren't trying to hold grudges and look for the little thing to be offended by and hold on to and put others down and look down on others. A patient gentleness. I want to be known as someone who's patiently gentle with other people and who has a joy that is attractive to the world, that's real, no matter what's going on currently in life. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Patient gentleness, a joy and a peace that's attractive to the world. Now, Another reminder, why should we have that? Verse 5, the Lord is at hand. I think sometimes we might miss, we go right to verses 6 through 7 about peace, peace in this world. Don't look, don't look over right here in verse 5. The Lord is at hand. Why can, I have, why can I have peace? Why can I have joy? The Lord is here. He's near. And he's coming back soon, closer than we think. So we can choose joy so we can receive peace. Verses six through seven. Before we read verses six through seven, I have more side roads. It's a side road kind of, kind of day. <clears throat> All right. Let's talk about anxiety for a second before we look at these verses. I heard someone say once, and it stuck with me, bitterness is looking at the past and believing that God got something wrong. Bitterness is looking at the past and saying, God messed up. Anxiety is looking at the future and believing that God will mess up. That he's not really in charge, that he's not really good, that he's not really wise, and that there's some circumstance coming that I can't handle. It's anxiety. I want to talk more about anxiety a little bit more generally. Remember, this passage is specifically focusing, it seems, on a feud that's happening and the stress that comes through, through relationships that need to be mended in this way. But I think, man, we struggle with anxiety at large in all kinds of ways. So I just want to talk a bit more about it generally, too. Anxiety defined by the Minister's Guide to Psychological Disorders and Treatments says... Anxiety is a universal human emotion. Yes? Yep. It is a general feeling of apprehension about possible danger. It's an uneasy feeling about events that are coming up or something that could happen in the future. Anxiety. There was a whole list of side effects of what happens when we become anxious and the way that it can harm us physically, and, and I thought, if I read this, this is a long, people are going to get anxious, so I'm just not going to read that. Instead, let's talk about receiving peace, right? But I want to go down another three more side roads, all right, about anxiety. Can I just stop a second here? This is a hard topic, okay? And if you're expecting for me to have everything you want to hear, every answer to anxiety and how to deal with it, I just can't do that. I just, I just don't. I don't have the ability to do that, not in a week. <laughs> no, no chance. But by the grace of God, he can teach us and show us and lead us right here, right now, where we are. Okay, side road number one. Is there such a thing as good anxiety? I'll just, before you shout out, I think there is. Good stress. What do I mean by that? When is it good? When you have responsibility? When you have something that you need to do? When you have people you care about? That can bring along with it 
good stress. The baby's crying at three in the morning, whoo, stress, go help fix, you know, do what needs to be done. When you care about someone, that can bring stress to want to work for their well-being. Paul, the same author of Philippians in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, said he had a daily pressure and anxiety for all the churches. Why? Because he cared about them. So he's praying for them, and he's trying to work for their best interests and tell them what, when they're going down false doctrines or when they need to fix this or fix that. He has this, this healthy stress for the churches. Is there such a thing as good anxiety? I think there is. But there's definitely such a thing as bad anxiety as well that he's addressing in this, in this passage. Another side road, that's one. Second one, there are such a thing as anxiety disorders. Why do I mention that? First of all, because there's a good chance multiple people right here, right now have that. I mention this so that we don't assume if someone is dealing and really struggling with anxiety, our first thought is not, oh, that person has a spiritual problem. That they're spiritually unhealthy, that if they just prayed harder, if they just did this or that, then they wouldn't have it. According to the book I just mentioned, 18%, and this was written in 2014, before the pandemic. It's only gone up. 18% of people have some kind of anxiety disorder. And psychotherapy can often be a successful treatment for that. And medication, if needed, we don't look down at medication. We can take medication and pray and trust God all at the same time. Can be helpful. I mention this to say, if someone's struggling with anxiety, our first thought should not be to, to judge them and think, if they only, it's a spiritual issue 100%. It's not always the case. Okay, one more side road. And it's, it's connected here. If you came to me and you wanted to talk about anxious feeling, you're, you're struggling with anxiety. Here's the overlap. My fr I'm not going to immediately tell you, well, you need to pray harder. Well, you need to memorize this verse about anxiety. I will talk about those things. I will talk about spiritual practices. I will want to talk about your prayer life. What does your time in the word look like? What is your time with community of believers and evangelism and all those things? How God wants us to live? Absolutely. But I believe that there's an over we are embodied souls. We're not just floating spirits going around. Everything we do affects us in every way, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, all of it. There's overlap. So I would ask you about how you're taking care of yourself. What does your sleep look like? What is your sleep schedule? Uh, what's going on at work that might be stressing you out? What are the relationships in your life that could be bringing anxiety to you? What's the food that you're eating? What does exercise look like? I think a holistic approach makes sense here to talk about this. When Elijah in 1 Kings 19 was stressed and depressed to the point where he wanted to take his own life, do you know what God did? First of all, Elijah took a nap. 1 Kings 19, you can check it. And then God brought him some food. And then after that, he had a conversation with Elijah. So, a lot of overlap here. Embodied souls. And just lastly, before I move on here, we all have empathy, especially for things we've dealt with or gone through ourselves, right? Anna will mention to me, people with back pain, you just have this extra, like you seem to care more about them and the struggles they have than other things. Well, it, part, it makes sense partly because I just understand that to a greater degree than I understand other struggles. But I will say I also have a decent understanding of anxiety because it's something I've experienced for sure as well. From age, from like sixth to eighth grade-ish, I had a stomach ache that would not go away. And I remember just imagining to myself, silly, you know, middle school Tori was thinking like, if I could just lay in a field somewhere and not be in pain, I will be happy. Almost two years of stomach ache. And the doctors thought it was because of stress. There, were t there are times, especially when I first moved here and I started preaching, that through a Sunday, like most of Sunday morning, I'd have this stiff neck. And I'd wonder, it's funny, I didn't connect the dots of like, it's stress. That's why you feel that. And I don't want to make it all sound past tense. There's times, there's times now on a Sunday morning where I will have a stiff neck because I'm stressed. 
What if, so, what, if, what, you know, what conversation might happen? What might happen today? What, what if I miss this point? What if I forget this? Anxiety, stress. Some of it can be good to want to do well. But I think a lot of times we, we bring ourselves more stress than we actually need or that God wants to give us. Well, how does the song go? What needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. So, everything we do affects us, embodied souls, but I'm certainly not going to neglect the most important part of all this, which is our walk with God. And what we see in verses 6 through 7 is this consistent, care-casting, thankful prayer life. So let's read the verses. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, when I memorized this verse, it was petition, so I'm just going to go with that. <laughs> with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be anxious about anything. I think what he's telling us is, don't dwell on the what ifs. What if this happens financially in my life? What if this happens with my health tomorrow or next week or next month? What if this happens with this relationship what if, what if, what if, what if, what if? And we get so stressed and filled with anxiety. But part of the thing with anxiety is it's not always telling us something we actually need to address. The what ifs is not a tangible do something about it. it remi- I've heard this a couple times now. When you're in your car and you got your dashboard in front of you and a light goes on, check engine light, whatever that triangle with the exclamation mark, I still don't know what that is. That's been on a while. <laughs> Tire pressure, okay. Thank you, I'll check that out. Um, You know, a light goes on, and it means you got to deal with something. you got to address something with your car. But with anxiety, when the lights are flashing, you're getting stressed about it. It doesn't always mean there's something to deal with. It could just be you're you're fantasizing about all the terrible what-ifs in the future. And I don't think we're supposed to do that. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything... By prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. You have those thoughts, those feelings, what what ifs of the future, bring it to the Lord. We can always talk to him, bring it to him, be honest, don't hold back. And here's something important, you do not need to become unanxious before you go to God in prayer. That might be the thing some of us just needed to hear and be reminded of this morning. You do not need to fix your anxiety before you go to God In prayer, we can go to him always, always. We bring our prayers and petitions to the Lord with thanksgiving. I think we miss that often too. We can be thankful while we pray, every time we pray, because God listens, because God God cares, because God has the power to do something about it, because unlike the beliefs of the people at the time and still around the world, the belief that you have to sacrifice to many different gods for them to hear you and care. We have, there's one true God that we can bring all of our requests, all of our needs to at once. And so we can be thankful. And God will often bring in our minds as we're praying all the different reasons we forgot about of why we can be thankful here and now. Pray with thanksgiving. And what does God do? He tells us in verse 7. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We pray, let God worry, which he doesn't do. (laughs) He gives peace, peace that transcends understanding. Tell me why the happiest guy in Rome was in a prison cell. (laughs) And maybe we can understand why peace doesn't always make sense. Peace that comes from God. Now, I have something I want to say here. Some of you might be thinking something like, look, I've had times where I've been anxious and it seems like nothing helps. It seems like God's not listening, that God doesn't care, and nothing seems to help me. I understand that. And here's what I want to tell you. There have been multiple times in some of the worst days of my life where my prayer looks something like this. God, I don't think I can handle this. I can't handle this pain. I can't handle this problem. And when I think about the future, if this does not go away, I don't think I can handle it. And I believe the way that God has responded to me in some of those moments and reminding me of what he says in his word is something like this. You don't have to worry about handling it tomorrow or the next day or a year from now. 
you can do today. That thought comes to mind, especially in the worst kinds of days, I need to be reminded of that. I don't know if I can do the future, but I can do today with God. You can do today with God, no matter what today brings. This reminds us what Jesus said, which surely Paul had that in mind as he's writing this to the Philippians of Matthew chapter 6. God hears, God cares, God will provide. And in Matthew 6, he reminds us that if he provides for the birds and the flowers, he'll provide for us. I want to read you a quote from Martin Luther. He says, I have one preacher that I love better than any other. It's my little tame Robin who preaches to me daily. I put his crumbs upon my windowsill, especially at night. He hops into the sill when he wants his supply and takes as much as he desires to fill his need. From there, he always hops to a little tree close by and lifts up his voice to God and sings his carol of praise and gratitude, tucks his little head under his wings and goes fast to sleep to leave tomorrow to look after itself. He is the best preacher I have on earth. God knows. God will provide. And Jesus reminds us that our Heavenly Father, not a distant uncle, not an uncaring aunt, our Heavenly Father tells us we don't need to worry. You do not need to worry about the future if you are in Christ. So, if you are a pragmatic person, it may help you or just frustrate you to know that worrying about the future only adds another problem to the current situation. I heard it said like this before, it's like sitting on a rocking chair, it gives you something to do, but you don't go anywhere. He says, don't worry. And if he says it, I'll take it seriously. And as he closes this out in verses 8 and 9, we see more ways to handle anxiety. Look at verse 8. Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Tells us what to think about. What we think about matters more than we think. What we fill our minds with affects us, and it can affect our anxiety or lack thereof. If we fill our minds with a news station that 98% of the time is giving us bad news, that might affect our stress level. If we're filling our minds with social media, which most of it is people posting only the positive and great things in their life, and fake news travels six times faster than the truth, and so we're filling our minds with that as well, and we compare ourselves and we get down, it can affect us. What we take in affects us. And so he's saying, think about, dwell on. And then he says there in verse 8, what to think about. I like to try to remember this verse, but it's not the easiest verse to remember because there's just a list of things to think about and to dwell on. And so when that happens, sometimes I make acronyms, even when they don't make a lot of sense. And so if that helps you to remember Philippians 4 verse 8 of what to remember, what to dwell on and think on, you can think Thujpulku. <laughs> Thujpulku. Whatever is true, honest, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise, Thujpulku, think about Thujpulku. <laughs> we can have peace in the midst of trouble when we think about the positives, the virtuous aspects, he says, of whatever is, and then he lists those things, whatever. So in people, in places, in professions, every corner you look around, there's probably something positive, virtuous aspects that we can think about, and what? Thank God for. Sometimes, uh, uh, Maybe the opposite of anxiety is thankfulness. That thought just came to my mind. I think that's probably true. I don't know. Thankfulness, as we think about the virtuous aspects in this world. Okay, we think about those things. Then in verse 9, he reminds us again what to practice. He said this multiple times now in different ways. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. All I want to say about this is, I've mentioned before the kind of people to look to, to learn from, and I think, I think it's very possible some of us have heard that and thought to ourselves, well, I'm not good enough. I'm not, I don't have enough answers to help 
other people that aren't as far along in their faith journey. And to that, I just want to hopefully encourage you and say, if you've been walking with Christ for any length of time, you do have things to offer. You do have things that we can learn from. You can take someone under your wing, so to speak, and, and teach them. Tell them your story. You can walk through a book of the Bible with someone or a great just Christian book. We, we can all, in, in healthy ways, help each other know the Lord more. I know in my own life, one of the best ways that I can get unstuck or even unanxious and un, so, so when I'm so occupied with my own life, I remember to look around and think about all the people God has put in our lives where we can help and help, uh, and help them know the Lord more and learn from ourselves as well in their walk with the Lord. What to practice. So we can have peace in the midst of trouble. Here's how I want to close this. I mentioned it at the beginning. Multiple times this phrase, in the Lord, takes place. In the Lord, in the Lord, four times in this passage. If you are here and you're, and you're not a Christian, the application is very simple. It's knowing Christ. It's giving your life to Christ. In this life, practices of trying to deal and handle stress and anxiety, you can, you can, you can do that in some way. Diet, exercise, talking to a, a counselor. There's all kinds of ways, breathing techniques, that can help you with anxiety. That can be helpful. But they can only go so far. And when, we think, when I think about what's coming, either if he returns or when we die and we face God, the loving thing for me to let you know is, I don't think you're going to be able to, I know you're not going to be able to handle that. There's no breathing technique. There's nothing that's going to help you when we face our God. The gospel is good news because he came, lived, died and rose for all of our sins. That's heavy, that's deep. Whatever you think you should be the most anxious about in your life, there's something far greater, and that is, that is God. That is our relationship with God. So if you haven't done business with God, let today be the day you do that. There'll be people ready to pray with you after the service. In the corner, it is as simple and as profound as yielding, submitting your whole life to Jesus Christ. If you're here and you are a Christian, <laughs> first, and maybe an, ex an exhortation is the right word, the kind of life Paul's been picturing, giving to us, one of patient gentleness with each other, one of choosing joy, one of bringing our cares to God so that we can receive his peace, where he guards our hearts and our minds like a squadron of soldiers protecting a treasure, he guards us and protects us and gives us his peace. That's a life that's attractive, as it should be, to a world that may not know that God exists and that they can go to him. So my admonition for us is to grow in the Lord in those ways. And to take this call to not be anxious. Not by trying harder, not by thinking we can accomplish it on our own, but because we are in Christ because we are in him. We can have his peace. So yes, there are plenty of reasons. There are plenty of reasons to be anxious. There are better reasons not to be. Let me pray for us. <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. Thank you <laughs> for this test of no air conditioning to see if we could not complain all day in here together. Thank you for the reminders you give us. Thank you for the hope you give us for the future that we can, have, we can have peace now and we can have peace in the future about the greatest thing that should cause us worry, which is a healthy fear of God. But we've been set free, we've been forgiven because of Jesus. Thank you for that, Lord God. Help us grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus that we can be a witness to a watching world that we can be more like Jesus who calls us to not be anxious and that we can be people that are not quick to fight with each other but that love each other enough to be real and honest and open and when we do find ourselves holding a grudge or bitterness against someone that we deal with it 
that we don't try to swipe, uh, put it under the rug, Lord, but deal with it. Lord, may we be a church that is united, that clearly cares for each other, whose names are in the book of life, found in you, Jesus. And we pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's worship now through celebrating communion together. And uh, we do this each week here at Terra because it's important for us to remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. So we have two stations, one on your left, one on your right. Come down either one at any point during these next few songs and come down the left and take the matzah and dip it in the wine or the juice. And hear words being proclaimed to you, his body broken for you, his blood shed for you. And then if you come over here, you can take the elements, the prepackaged ones back to your seat and hear also those words being proclaimed to you. There's gluten-free options on either side, and if you are a follower of Christ, you are welcome to partake um, and celebrate with us. Let me read to you from 1 Corinthians, though, before, so we know what we're walking into. For I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink the cup, proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats drinks without discerning the body, eats and drinks judgment on himself. So we want to give some space here. You do not have to feel rushed. You do not have to come forward in the first song. Um, we will do this until everyone has had a chance to celebrate um, this time together. So if you need to sit, kneel, um, stand, whatever posture you need to take in order to ready your heart to receive what the Lord has for us, do that now. But we'll sing.
there's no sorrow heaven can't so lay down your burdens lay down your shame all you are broken lift up your face my shepherd I shall not walk He makes me lie down in those greener pastures He leads me beside still waters of life He restores my his name is sin. Jesus, you are the shepherd of my soul. Jesus, lead me, protector of my soul. Jesus, you are the 
shepherd of my soul. Jesus, lead me, protector of my soul. feels like there is nothing around us that would give us peace. Father, you surround us. Lord, as we hear these words from your word, help us to know that there is peace in the midst of trouble. That we can bring everything to you because you care and you want us to. Father, allow your spirit to remind us in those moments where we are fearful and we are anxious that you are right by our side. We thank you for Jesus and the gift of his life for ours. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Have a seat for a moment, Jinha. morning, family. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Junha. I serve as an intern here. If you're new here, welcome. We're so glad to have you join us, hang with us, worship with us. Um, one of our values as a church is that we want to be Christocentric, and so we hope that from the worship songs to the sermon, even up until the fellowship after the service, that Christ was and is revealed. Um, and we would love to get to know you. Um, and if you want to get to know us, please feel free to uh, fill out a connect card that's over by the welcome table or you can scan the QR code on your guide page. Uh, next, this is a part of our service that as we reflect upon God's generosity towards us, his kindness, how he gives us peace, uh, we can respond through our giving. And here at Tarot, we like to say that we want to give sacrificially, joyfully, and regularly as God has done to us. And so there's a few ways you can do this. You can give physically by uh, placing your offerings by in the in the black box by the welcome table, and there's also digital options as well by uh, scanning your QR code and uh, a text to give option as well. Next, we have a few uh, announcements. Um, if you're trying to get emotionally healthy this summer, we still have a few uh, spots available, both in Monday night and Tuesday night. Um, it's emotionally healthy spirituality by Pete Scazzaro, led by uh, the Baileys and. Um, Deskins, I'm sorry. Um, and so if you're interested, uh, please email Heidi um, at terranovachurch.org. Next, our young adult group uh, called YAG will be having their annual uh, paddleboarding event at the Kayak Shack in Saratoga. If you want to vote on a time slot for this event and have more information, uh, please see the event in our app or the Facebook event page as well. And lastly, starting July 7th, uh, for three weeks, we will have our church services outdoors at Sage Park. Uh, we'll be starting our new uh, summer series, Our Favorite Verses. That's shaped by our congregation um, on verses that you guys submitted. Um, and so a few reminders. Service will start at 10 a.m. You will need to bring your own lawn chair or blanket to sit on. There won't be any restrooms available. Um, and also, no terror kids. Um, and lastly, if there's any rain or extreme heat, service will be, be held here at the Boys and Girls Club. Um, and so make sure you've downloaded our Terra Nova app um, for any changes or notifications uh, so that you can be notified in any, um, in any changes that come up. So we hope to see you there. Have a great week, Terra. Thank you, Junha. Let's uh, go declaring the, the words that Pastor Tori prayed and shared, being more like Jesus. We desire that this time here together is not just... Uh, a good time, but actually it's time that is informing us and directing us to be more like Jesus. So let's stand and close with this last song.
Counting your status as nothing. The King of all kings came to serve. Washing my feet, covering me with your love. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. says these words for us as we go. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen, church. Amen, church. Have a great week.